As you can see, it's Friday, October 27th, and I am a few hours into my hard drive fast. I started at 4 p.m. I'm not sure how many days it will last, but my previous fast lasted 11 days. So I would like to be able to do at least 11 days. Of course, I always like to challenge myself and push my boundaries, so I would be elated if I could go past my 11-day record. That being said, um, it's not really possible to commit to a set time frame or say with any certainty that, yes, uh, this is going to happen. Because the truth is that you really never know what's going to happen during a fast. You can have all kinds of plans, but the body has its own agenda and you have to sort of go along with what the body wants to do and what it's capable of doing at any given time. So I'm going to keep my ego and my expectations in check without putting any unreasonable pressure on myself. This is also going to be my first time recording myself during a fast and documenting what happens to my body and how it changes, which might end up being mildly interesting for those of you who practice extended dry fasting. By the way, um, sorry for my diction. You can probably hear that I am lisping a bit. It's because I am wearing my Invisalign retainer, which has to be worn for a minimum amount of time to prevent my teeth from moving. And since I practice hard dry fasting, I of course avoid all contact with water, which means that I don't brush my teeth while I fast. So for me, it's simply easier and more convenient to just put it in and keep it in place throughout the entire duration of the fast as opposed to having to periodically take it out and clean it before having to put it back again. So hopefully you can understand what I'm saying here. Now in preparation for this fast, the last two days I've consumed nothing but juice and have done multiple enemas to clean out my GI tract. You never ever want to go into an extended dry fast with food or waste kicking around your intestines. So as per usual, yesterday I had fresh pressed pear juice which cleans out your gut really well. And then I continue to drink orange juice afterwards because pear juice is a bit of a diuretic. And I wanted to ensure that I rehydrated well enough after having lost some water as a result of the pear juice's diuretic effect. I have also been 100% salt free for the last four weeks. So this will be interesting to see how not having had salt this, this whole time is going to impact my fast. I don't know if you know this, but salt is extremely dehydrating, contrary to what many people believe. Ingesting salt actually pulls water out of your cells and into the interstitial spaces around the cells because the body wants to dilute salt, which is a substance that it perceives to be harmful and even poisonous. And that's why you always feel really thirsty after having eaten something that's very salty. Now, I know that some people lick salt while dry fasting, thinking that this somehow helps their adrenals or keeps them hydrated, which I think is crazy because for one, salt dehydrates you on the cellular level 
and two, consuming anything at all defeats the very purpose of the fast. If you are consuming anything whatsoever, you are not dry fasting. The whole point of dry fasting is that the body switches to this entirely endogenous feeding and nourishment. It's an endogenous mode of operation. This means that everything happens in-house. Food and water are derived from the body's own tissues. And because of this, there is a state of balance and homeostasis when nothing is coming into the body from outside, making it a semi-closed system. And the reason that it's not fully closed is that the skin and the lungs become absorbers of ambient water. But as soon as you take something in, anything, be it water or salt, whether you do it through the mouth or the rectum, because I have also heard of people doing enemas during their dry fast. So what happens is that you instantly disrupt and leave that balanced endogenous state. So I want to remind people to be cognizant of what makes dry fasting so special and effective and the conditions that must be met in order to reap its amazing benefits. You know, it's funny because I recently made a post on social media about salt and how poisonous it is to the body. And I was shocked as to how many people pretty much called me a moron for saying that. I mean, people damn near came after me with torches and pitchforks, like I was some sort of a heretic who was caught practicing witchcraft in the woods. So I think this will be a good experiment and an experience to observe if there really is a difference in how thirsty I get farther down the road into my fast. Now, I don't know if I'll be recording videos every single day or every other day. I suppose that it'll depend on whether or not I have something of note to report. Uh, I guess I'll just have to play it by ear. So you can see from my phone, it's Thursday, October 29th, and I have gotten through the first two days of the fast and have officially entered day three. I will continue to show you my phone throughout this video diary as proof of dates and times. What's interesting is that right before I started my fast, and I'm talking literally the day before, my nails started cracking in half horizontally and splitting. This is right in the middle of the nail bed where the nail is firmly attached to the skin. It was very uncomfortable and even painful because my nails were snagging on fabric, hair, and so on, causing these uh, loose ends to be pulled and in some instances even torn off. So not fun as you can imagine. Now, three days into the fast, these cracks are becoming smooth and look like they're repairing. This is surprising because I always thought that the way this problem would correct itself is that the damaged areas would just have to grow out and be cut off while the body grows stronger nails from the root to replace the defective keratin. Because we were taught that the nail is essentially a dead tissue and once broken, even in areas that are still attached to the skin, it cannot be repaired. 
but this doesn't appear to be the case. I'm seeing the fissures closing up and becoming seamlessly smooth. So this is a very interesting and I would say important discovery, especially considering how quickly this damage repair occurred. Basically only after two days of fasting because um, I am currently only about five hours into day three. Also consider this, if this is happening with the nails, then this also must be happening with the teeth. It's really fascinating and exciting. You know, I learn new things about the healing capabilities of the body with each dry fast that I undertake. I think that the reason why this healing is happening so soon into the fast is that I moved through the initial stages fairly quickly. What do I mean? My first acidic crisis occurred less than eight hours into the fast. And that's when the body has burned through the glycogen reserves in the liver and then starts to break down fat for energy. This process is called ketosis and the blood gets flooded with its byproducts. And it's the release of these acids that makes us feel ill. I get a headache and feel really fatigued. And even though it feels counterintuitive because you feel like crap, and you just want to curl up in your bed, actually the best thing to do is to get up and get moving. Short bursts of intense exercise with deep breathing increases oxygenation of tissues and improves circulation of both blood and lymph, all of which clear the toxic ketones. So you start to feel better almost instantly. And breathing is especially important because we inhale moisture and oxygen and exhale all kinds of toxic material and not just CO2. I like to do um, the Wim Hof breathing, especially when it rains like it has for the last couple of days because then the air contains more water. I also love fasting when it gets colder outside because the cold is alkalizing and is more supportive of adrenal function. Those who have difficulty breathing during a fast will especially feel this notable difference. So my first acidic crisis has passed in less than 18 hours, which I'm really pleased with because this process can take as long as three days. So now my body can ramp up autophagy and from this point it's full steam ahead with cleansing and regeneration which I have already witnessed with my nails. You see the less you consume in the days prior to the fast the less glycogen loading you have and therefore less work the body will have to do before triggering ketosis. Also, the cleaner your diet is, and by this I mean raw, and the more consistently you practice fasting, the quicker the body is going to make this transition. It simply becomes like second nature. I also want to talk about breatharianism. Sorry for being so verbose, but I figure let me just say what's on my mind while I can still talk because at some point my voice will weaken considerably and speaking will become uh, much more difficult. I watched the 60 Minutes 
episode on YouTube last night where they put um, Jess Muheen's claims of being a breatharian to the test. And uh, unfortunately, she failed miserably. She only lasted about four days, which isn't even that long of a fast. And she uh, blamed the quality of the city air during the first couple of days for poisoning her and saying that because of this air pollution, she wasn't able to get the nutrients that her body needed. I mean, what a fraud. A lot of people online, especially on YouTube, claim to be breatharians when in fact they're not. Period. Full stop. Many use the term quite loosely considering that if they don't consume solid food, then they're breatharians. So sorry Ray Mayor, even though drinking mainly liquids as a form of sustenance is impressive, it doesn't make you a breatharian nonetheless. Other so-called gurus either exaggerate or downright lie about it. Let's be very clear. A breatharian is someone who consumes nothing at all, be it food or liquid, and lives in such a state permanently, full-time. Extended fasting doesn't make you a breatharian any more than abstaining from meat on Friday makes you a vegan. Fasting, especially the hard dry type, is different from breatharianism. In some ways, absolute dry fasting is actually more restrictive because there is zero contact with water, while breatharianism is only about consumption. If you are a breatharian, you bathe and swim without restrictions. Victor Truviano, who I believe to be the real deal and one of the very few, says that he spends a lot of time in the rivers and other natural bodies of water. But on the other hand, fasting is a limited experience, which once concluded, returns the fasting person to regular consumption of exogenous food and liquids, depending on the individual's personal diet. I see that there is um, quite a bit of fascination with this breatharian phenomenon, especially in the fasting community. It's seen as some sort of holy grail of achievement. But this obsession is a symptom of an unbalanced, unhealthy ego. And that's just my humble opinion, and you can take it or leave it. Many people strive to become breatharians because they want to be special, somehow better or above the rest of the ordinary Dicks, Janes, or Harrys. They think that giving up eating and drinking is going to bring about spiritual transformation and enlightenment. But in my opinion, this way of thinking is actually backwards. As Dr. Morse would say, they're looking at this by starting at the S end of the donkey. Starvation doesn't bring enlightenment, but transcending the ego, achieving emotional balance, and letting go of all attachment to the material world will change and refine your frequency in such a way that your physical body will become less dense and will no longer require physical food for sustenance. I work with people as a regression facilitator where I hypnotize my clients and take them to other lifetimes and existences. 
in my practice, most people no longer go to the so-called past lives, which aren't in the past at all, but simply happen concurrently on other bands of frequency. Often, my clients experience existences in alien worlds, and these can be either on other planets or in energetic dimensions of existence. And they often see themselves as more evolved beings or versions of themselves as compared to their human incarnation. And the common thread I see is that these civilizations either consume liquids, most often this is described as some sort of natural nectar derived from plants, or they consume nothing at all and are directly sustained by the source energy. And they're still physical in the sense that they have bodies, but compared to humans, their physicality is much less dense. Another thing they have in common is their level of consciousness. They're loving, peaceful, entirely nonviolent, and form communities and societies that are extremely supportive of one another rather than being competitive. Many of these societies are telepathic, where each individual is plugged in to the collective consciousness and is fully aware of what the other members are thinking and feeling. Now, to most of us, this is a scary prospect, and we would think of it as an invasion of privacy. But the truth is that the only reason we think this way is that most of us have too many thoughts that are shameful and less than nice, let's say. We are afraid what others would think of us if they knew our innermost thoughts, desires, and fears. Most of them are unfortunately nothing to be proud of. And of course, our belief that our thoughts are private is an ignorant delusion to begin with. They aren't private to those who are in spirit or who are really sensitive to energy. Because energy never lies. And everything, including our thoughts and feelings, is nothing more than energy, which is a range of frequencies from the very subtle to the very dense. To better understand this, simply think of the difference in frequency of a thought and compare it to the frequency of a rock. Both are energetic manifestations, but of different densities that are defined by their unique individual frequency. Our dense physicality acts as a barrier and dulls our ability to perceive the more subtle energies. It's almost like constantly wearing soundproof headphones and believing that sound doesn't exist just because we can't hear it. But those who aren't wearing these proverbial headphones freely perceive the whole range of the existing auditory stimuli that permeates the space all around us. Robert Monroe, who was a well-known astral projector, refers to the sound of our internal thoughts in his books as the M noise, in other words, mental noise, which can be perceived from the astral dimension and is quite unbearable to those who are disembodied and can freely perceive it. So we can hide behind our bodies and words, but the energy tells the real story. 
being somewhat energetically sensitive, I can tell you that the great majority of people who claim to be breatharians are frauds. Using this concept to elevate their narcissistic egos in order to get public attention or admiration, and in many cases, to make money. There was a discussion in the fasting group I belong to about the so-called Bertharian Elohim, who has um, a self-admitted history of sexual harassment, for which he apologized once he got caught. Now, people found it hard to reconcile that someone who is a Bertharian would behave in such a despicable way. Well, a true Bertharian wouldn't do what Elotin did because you can't be a predator, sexual or otherwise, and a Bertharian, all wrapped up in the same package. People who achieve the ability to exist in a Bertharian state no longer operate from their lower chakras, which become less active as their frequency becomes um, less dense and more refined. Our first, second, and third chakras have to do with sex, procreation, appetites, as well as fears and insecurities. Once we have dealt with blockages and imbalances in these energy centers. Our top chakras, from the heart up, open up and become more activated and are also then more front and center in how we manifest in the world. This means that the person is no longer driven by their gonads and their lower survival instincts, like hunger and procreation. Opening the heart is the first step towards Bertharianism because it means more empathy, compassion, and it also means embracing every other being as a part of yourself. It's the first step in surrendering the ego defenses and realizing that there's no separation and that we are all one consciousness. And it's not just about recognizing this on a mental level or, or as we like to say intellectually, but fully integrating this idea into our daily living. This means that you act and live as one with the universe and all of creation. This energetic transformation is essential for transitioning to Bertharianism. Without it, a person won't be able to let go of food and especially more so of water. A great degree of emotional maturity is required as well. You can't have emotional fluctuations, be they good or bad, and be a Bertharian. I watched some speakers participating in the World Bertharian Summit, and one young woman named Lucy made a very astute observation. She said that to sustain Bertharian lifestyle, you must remain in a constant, serene, and even keeled emotional state. This means no anger, sadness, and even strong excitement. And she's absolutely right, because emotions keep us bound to the body. And we see this especially clearly when it comes to astral projection. Those who are lucid projectors or have cultivated the ability to leave their body at will, they know that 
it's quite easy to get out of the body, but it's much more challenging to stay out and maintain lucidity. As soon as you get scared or excited, you're instantly zapped back into your body. And even if by some miracle you do manage to stay in the projected state, you will find that you lose lucidity. That is, the ability to be present and aware and remember that experience. Having emotions in the out-of-body state causes a blackout, meaning we lose consciousness. In other words, emotions cloud our judgment and therefore automatically lower our frequency. If you observe people like Victor Trubiano or Eckhart Tolle, you will get an idea of the temperament and the range of frequency that is compatible with breatharianism. You will also find that individuals who maintain such vibrational frequency have practically no sex appeal. They may be attractive, but are somehow devoid of sexiness. And this is no accident, because sexual charisma and magnetism are the result of a strongly active root chakra. I'm sure you know many people who aren't necessarily good-looking, yet they exude great sexual appeal, which makes them very attractive. And this is all due to the energy of their root chakra, which in some nomenclatures is also called the sex chakra. So my point here is that as long as our lower chakras continue to dominate, we will find it pretty much impossible to let go of material needs, which include the attachments of the flesh, such as sex and hunger. If you're vain and the prospect of losing your teeth and hair scares you, then you're not ready to stop eating and drinking. If you're familiar with Victor Trubiano, whom I already mentioned, then you know that that's exactly what happened to him. His hair and all of his teeth fell out, but he didn't freak out. He accepted it as a part of his journey. Eventually, he did regrow both the hair and the teeth. But the important takeaway from his story is that when you become a true breatharian, your whole body restructures and rebuilds itself. You literally get a brand new and different body that functions completely differently than our current physical organism. He even said that when he was getting medical tests done, the machines couldn't read his vitals. So please understand, that one cannot become a breatharian without a complete physical, emotional, and energetic transformation, as well as the acceptance that your lifestyle is going to be completely different, which is a must because you're no longer driven by the same motivation. If you're driven by a desire of finding a soulmate and having children, then you're not ready to become a breatharian. If you strive to be successful in your career or want to attain fame and glory, then you most definitely aren't ready for breatharianism. Anything that creates attachment and karma keeps you entrenched 
in the dense muck of this physical reality and therefore prevents you from being able to transition to breatharianism full time because breatharianism isn't about food, it's about spiritual evolution. Food and water simply happen to be the final vestiges of the hold that this dense physical reality has on us. True breatharians are a different breed and a different species of human in that they're actually quasi-physical. They may look like other humans on the surface, but they're very different, both energetically and physically. So not many people can achieve this in their lifetime, but they don't need to either. And this is the key. We come into this life with a specific mission or existential program, if you will. This program depends on the unique goals and the themes that each individual soul has chosen to explore in a given lifetime. And these goals may very well be contrary to pursuing a life as a breatharian. In other words, developing the ability to live exclusively off prana may not only be irrelevant to your existential program, but may actually hinder your mission. So why focus on achieving breatharianism with such ardent fervor? Many times this obsession with becoming breatharian is just another way of avoiding one's own life and its many issues. It becomes a tactic or a coping mechanism to dissociate, which is actually a trauma response just like drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, or any other addiction. So I would advise some discernment and recommend that you do some soul searching before you decide that this is the path for you. Try to achieve some mental and emotional balance while staying in the present moment as much as possible. Just because breatharianism is possible, it doesn't mean that it's a probability for you personally and that you should strive to achieve it. After all, theoretically, we could overcome gravity, but how likely are we to accomplish this? I'd say not very, mostly because it's of no consequence to our life mission and spending time on trying to attain this goal would only distract us from doing what we actually came here to do. The sign of maturity and intelligence is knowing what's for you and what isn't, what's relevant to your journey and what is a distraction. Personally, I enjoy fasting, but have no current ambitions to give up food and water permanently. If this is something I'm supposed to do in this lifetime, then the path will naturally unfold in front of me, making the direction very clear. So learn to trust your life and how it unfolds to guide you on your authentic path. Align with your true core self and you will know what to do. There's no need to compare yourself to others and what they're doing because they have their own unique purpose that has nothing to do with you. So just focus on yourself. Follow your highest excitement. Listen to the signs. Listen to your higher self when it speaks to you and you will be exactly where you need to be.
Today is October 31st, so happy Halloween. I have completed four days of fasting and have entered day five about um, six hours ago or so. As you can see, I'm starting to look a bit grimy, greasy, and worse for wear. But uh, don't let that fool you because I'm actually feeling quite good. I'd say that so far things have been easy breezy and are moving along almost effortlessly. God, I hope I don't jinx myself by saying this. But um, I work out every single day, even multiple times per day. Now, it's not like I'm putting in hours pumping iron. No. I do 15-20 minutes of yoga first thing when I wake up and then throughout the day I may do a couple of additional 5-10 to 10 minute sets of intense physical activity like push-ups or lunges or a few exercises with 12 pound weights plus some deep stretching. I also use the foam roller every single day. Now all of this is to simply keep the blood and lymph moving, which of course aids in detoxification. I can also report that I have no thirst, hunger or cravings, and it's important to distinguish between hunger and cravings because they're not the same. A craving is a trauma response to a triggered, uncomfortable emotion that threatens a person's mental balance. Hunger, on the other end, is the body's signal that it needs energy and nutrition. And this is not food specific. Actually, let me back up. It's not entirely true that I have not had any cravings. Though I would not classify this particular one as a craving, but more as a desire because of its lack of persistence, intensity, and urgency. I have had short, fleeting moments when I felt a desire for alcohol. Now, this is somewhat bizarre because I do not drink at all, as in I never touch the stuff, ever without exception. For one, I despise the taste. And then I also hate the way it makes me feel. However, my maternal grandfather was an alcoholic and he died from this dreadful disease. Also one of my aunts, his daughter, was an alcoholic as well. So I must have inherited the gene, which, albeit inactive, is still there nonetheless. So my theory is that the body must be digging deep into the genetics during this fast and bringing whatever defects are there up to the surface. Another interesting thing I'd like to mention is that normally at this point in the fast I would lose my voice and experience a sore throat and I would also be blowing chunks of hardened black and bloody mucus from my nose but I'm not having any of these symptoms 
as of yet. Of course, they may still come up further down the road, so I guess I'll have to see and wait what happens. I have had some emotional releases, starting from day one, where a lot of my fears came up to the surface, and I found myself crying and even sobbing. So I just went along with it and found these episodes to be very cathartic and cleansing. There was an almost instant feeling of peace and calm right afterwards. So this has happened actually on day one and then day three. I'm still sleeping, though the duration is decreasing and I'm averaging about five, six hours. But the quality of sleep is really good still, so I have no complaints here. And I'm having lots and lots of vivid dreams. In one dream, I, I ate some crepes and I was so horrified by this reckless action that I was kicking myself for breaking my fast so carelessly. I felt really crushed and despondent. I was so depressed, but then I woke up and I was immeasurably relieved when I finally realized that it was only a dream. So. It's been a fun and interesting journey so far, and I'll just keep giving you updates as I move along. It's after 1 a.m. on November 3rd, which means that I am nine hours into day seven. My eyes are sunken in and I have developed dark under eye circles. My lips are so dry, rough and chapped that you could probably grate cheese on them. Now, I don't know if you can see this well enough in the lighting that I got going on as I am recording this video at night. So, I'm going to come closer to the camera so that you can have a better look. No, it's not pretty, but what can I say? Fasting isn't a glamorous process. My voice has gotten much weaker as well, as I'm sure you can hear for yourselves. I told you a couple of days ago that I didn't have any mucus coming out of my nose. But of course, five days in, the familiar expectorations of hardened mucus that have been a part of every one of my fasts came back, but with a new twist. I also started getting a scratchy throat, which in of itself isn't unusual. But then I started to feel gobs of mucus sliding from my nasal cavity down my throat. Oof, boy, was that gross. I coughed up a bunch of thick green and brown chunks. Initially, I didn't want 
to post these images due to their graphic and decidedly unpleasant nature. But then I thought about it, and I decided that showing what detox really looks like can have an educational value. So if you're squeamish, now is the time to look away. This is what chronic level of congestion and lymph stagnation looks like. Is it disgusting? You bet. But this is what 99.9999999% of the entire human population have inside them. This crap is what's strangling our thyroids and parathyroids and is clogging up our brains. So it's essential that we get it out if we want to grow our hair back and restore our gland function. What's amazing is that as soon as this mucus was eliminated, my throat immediately got back to feeling perfectly normal. What else? I have also had some liver pains and kidney spasms and I have also experienced activity in my GI tract in the form of gurgling and what felt like contractions. <clears throat> Another interesting thing that I've experienced is that now whenever I come across images of food on social media, instead of getting hungry, my stomach turns. I mean, I literally feel nauseous. This is something new. I have also developed a strong hankering for grape juice with lemons and ginger. So, go figure. You know, I'm still sleeping five to six hours daily but not in one stretch. Now my sleep is becoming fragmented where I can get three hours in one sitting and then sometime later I lie down and get another two. Still, I feel well rested and I don't really have a problem with this especially considering that nine, ten days into the fast, I could be getting a pitiful of total 15 minutes per day. So right now, I'll take whatever I can get. Despite how I sound, my energy is still good. I still keep working out on the same schedule. And my mobility is pretty good as well. People have asked me if fasting stresses the adrenals. No, it does not. What stresses the adrenal glands is physical, emotional, and mental stress. Also stimulants including salt, and artificial steroids and hormones. 
However, if your adrenals are really weak, the fast will show you the full extent of that weakness. Having weak adrenals doesn't mean that you cannot fast. I have done it for years, up to five days, and my adrenals were shot. I find that fasting actually heals adrenal glands just as it heals all the other organs of the body. Now, if you have underperforming adrenals, you will have to be more mindful and careful, and you'll have to adjust your behavior during the fast. For example, if you're getting up, you're going to have to do it very slowly, You'll have to steady yourself before moving or walking. You should always have something around that you could hold on to, like a piece of furniture or a wall, in case you get dizzy or lightheaded. You gotta walk slowly and take long, deep breaths. Also, keeping your environment really cool is going to help you tremendously. The colder, the better. Even if you normally don't tolerate cold well, like I do, when you get into that state when you're burning up inside, that cold is going to feel so soothing, it's going to feel like a breath of life. So cold air, cold temperature will get your energy up and it will also help you breathe better. So don't freak out or get scared when you experience weakness or dizziness because it's normal to feel that way when your adrenals are down. I first felt a significant improvement in my adrenal function during my seven-day dry fast, which took place, I believe, at the end of December of last year. And ever since then, I kept experiencing better and better adrenal function. I no longer use any herbs or glandulars. So, yes, you can fast with weak adrenals and you can heal your adrenal gland with fasting. It's November 5th and I am 19 hours into day 9, which is a very exciting milestone because once I get to day 9, days 10 and 11 are just a stone's throw away. As you can see, I'm getting more radiant and better looking with each passing day. I actually trimmed some of the dry skin off of my lips because it started to separate in, in chunks like a hangnail. <clears throat> As a purist, I, I don't put anything on my skin or lips during the hard dry fast. There are no ointments or oils, which means that my lips get extremely dry 
and gnarly looking. But uh, I get around it by cutting off that skin with small manicure scissors. But you got to be careful not to injure yourself. As you can see today, I'm also using a microphone because my voice has gotten so weak that I'm worried that you might not be able to hear me. I guess we'll see how this goes. So about 19 hours into day eight, the second acidic crisis occurred, which was about right on time. And um, I got the fever with the chills while also having this nuclear heat permeating my internal tissues. It's such a bizarre sensation when you're freezing while also feeling on fire at the same time. I mean, I'm still kind of shaking a little bit. I was icing my head while lying under a thick blanket when a voice in my head said to me, you got to stop trying to cool yourself down. We are generating heat to kill pathogens. Now, I don't know if this is um, some fever-induced delusion or delirium, or if my body was actually communicating with me. And let me tell you, this, this crisis kicked my butt a little bit. I felt incredibly weak, and all I wanted to do was just curl up in bed and not move. I didn't do my normal exercise routine, but I did do some minimal movements like getting into a plank, doing some push-ups, and rolling on the roller a bit. And despite feeling like out of crap, I was also really excited because I know what a healing crisis is, no matter how uncomfortable it may be. It means that the body is getting to the very root of an ailment. I am still continuing to eliminate mucus, both from my nose and my throat. The amount of sediment in my urine has also doubled during this time. My urine has been very, very dark orange, much like the sediment itself. Now, most people think that it's sulfur. That is not the case because sulfur is eliminated through the bowels, not urine. And it's uric acid that gives urine this orange tinge. So while sediment is very important and is a very good sign, the color of the urine is important as well because it indicates the specific type of chemistry that's being eliminated. So I'm going to show you the filtration I've been getting. Not sure if you can see this. I'm going to tilt it a bit so you can see the sediment on the bottom. Hmm. 
Now, I figured that since I've already shown you my snot, what's a little urine amongst old friends? I mean, we're all adults here, right? Another thing I would like to mention is that the last two fasts, I've been experiencing UTI-like symptoms, which always start on days eight or nine, and therefore coincide with the timing of the second acidic crisis. With each consecutive fast, the symptoms diminish and are of a considerably shorter duration. It's as if the body requires multiple attempts to eliminate one particular problem. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is that people have asked me if doing one 11 day fast would resolve their issues completely. This has not been my experience. From what I've observed is that our issues are so numerous and so deep that many fasting sessions are necessary to rectify them. Of course, what you do outside of fasting is equally, if not more important. And here I'm talking about the raw diet. It seems to me that the body can tackle roughly 30% of any given problem at a time. Anyhow, <clears throat> excuse me, it's really hard to talk to for me right now. The second acidic crisis passed within about 18 hours. And now I'm feeling better not 100%, I still have some remnants of that feverishness and discomfort. And as you can probably tell, I have lost quite a bit of weight at this point. But I'd say I'm in high spirits and feeling positive overall. I'm not hungry or particularly thirsty. The only issue I'm having is that it's been too warm, which does make things more difficult. The temperatures in New York are climbing into the 70s, and I would like it to be much, much colder than that. You know, it's funny because normally I don't like the cold. And as soon as the temperature hits 60, I'll be the first one putting a parka on. But when I fast, I like my place, my apartment, to feel like a meat locker. Because the cold gives me more energy and it helps me to breathe. No wonder that Swami Satmarga does his fast in the middle of winter, and you can see him walk around barefoot in the snow in nothing but his underwear. And God, do I un understand that? I totally get it. I know why he does that. You see, warm temperatures rob adrenals of nerve energy making it difficult to expand the diaphragm and lungs in order to fill the body with enough oxygen. 
And if you are not properly oxygenating, then you're lacking energy. Your blood circulation is poor, and you're more likely to feel dizzy and lightheaded. So it's going to be interesting because, as per the forecasts that I have seen on TV, these unseasonable temperatures are expected to hold for a few days. So I guess I will see a lot of ice packs in my future. Um, 22 hours into day 11, which means that within the next two hours, I will have reached the top limit of my previous fast. As of now, I plan on continuing to fast for another 24 hours bringing it to 12 full days. It's getting quite difficult now, as there is no sleep, and I have also been feeling like I'm burning up from the inside out. I have also had this feeling of extreme queasiness the last couple of days. If you're familiar with John Rose, who does a lot of juice feasts, he often talks about the so-called serpent that lives, that lives inside our GI tract. Well, I feel this serpent very acutely as it threshes around my intestines. It's as if something is trying to get out and I can feel it coming up into my throat, causing me to constantly burp up. So, I either want to regurgitate and puke it up already or have it come out the other end because I just really, really, really desperately want to be free of this thing, whatever it is. I'm going to show you a picture of what I look like now. Um, 11 days into of no food and no water. Of course, keep in mind that I started out around 109 pounds and this is where I am now. The ice packs have been my saving grace right now as they provide such blissful, albeit a very temporary relief from my very significant discomfort. So I'm ready to be done with this, and I'm looking forward to getting through the next 24 hours and then finally breaking my fast. Hi guys, it's been 
12 days since I started my fast at 4 p.m. on Tuesday, October 27th. I know that I misspoke in that first recording saying that it was Friday, but I believe that um, having shown you the screen of my phone during each recording gives you an accurate timeline of my fast. I thought that I was going to have some sort of a big reveal with breaking this fast on video, but I've been just so tired and at the end of my rope that it didn't matter anymore. As you can see, I haven't bathed or changed yet because everything just feels like way, 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 way too much effort. And all I want to do is go to sleep. But I wanted you to see how quickly things turn around once the fast is broken. At least in um, how it affects the voice. You know, it used to take at least 12 hours back when I was doing five-day fasts as my top duration. And now all it takes is an hour at most. So you can see how quickly you can go from sounding like death to sounding pretty much normal, the way you usually do. Now, breaking a fast is always hard, and I feel way worse than I did during the fast itself. I broke it with water, of course. Well, ice cubes actually because after being so hot for so long you just want something extremely cold going down your throat. Besides, using ice cubes prevents you from drinking too much and too quickly, allowing for a slower and more even saturation of the mucosa. Now, even though I had broken the fast a few hours ago, I still feel hot on the inside. In fact, my whole body feels like a giant hot spot. Everything is hot to the touch. You know, the hardest thing about dry fasting for such a long period of time is this internal heat and lack of sleep. It's not thirst and it's certainly not hunger. Only a couple of days ago I was laid out on the bathroom floor in my underwear beneath the open window trying to cool my body down on the ceramic tiles while covering my head with ice. And mind you, I was only a couple of feet away from the cat litter box and I did not give a flying fig. Imagine what it feels like when you're just skin and bones and you're having to lie on the tiled floor to bring your body temperature down just a bit. Now my, my body still hurts so bad just from that alone. When you reach this level of desperation, things like appearances, food, and water, they don't matter at all. In fact, I can't even look at any food right now as the very idea of food is making me sick. So if you have struggled with any food addictions, going on a long dry fast can break you out of that vicious cycle like nothing else. When I finally did break the fast, I got really emotional. And I still do feel emotional without being able to pinpoint the exact feelings. It's just sort of been 
like a watershed of sorts. And this is different from the first three days of the fast when a lot of my fears had come up. I don't know if you're aware of this, but specific emotions have affinity to specific organs. For instance, liver holds anger and kidneys hold fear. So when you begin detoxing these organs, aside from the chemical release, you may also experience the appropriate emotional release. But that is not what has happened since breaking the fast, as this emotional release that I'm experiencing now is non-specific. So this could be something that may become clearer in the days to come. In terms of detox and healing, this has to have been the most productive fast I've done to date, where all the stages happened at the right times and in the correct way. Could I have pushed myself beyond the 12 days? Maybe, probably, but to what end? You know, the dry fasting literature by the Russian uh, physicians who have perfected this type of medical fasting states that the most effective time frame for the healing is 11 to 12 days of fasting. Urinary sediment increases days 8 through 11 which is when the deepest and most profound healing can occur. This, of course, maxes out at 11 days, and you will see this because uh, the sediment will decrease and then stop. And this turned out to be completely accurate for me as well. Toward the end of day 11, I stopped seeing sediment. There was still cloudiness, in the very dark orange urine, but nowhere close to the output that I was getting just a couple of days prior. Now, since I've broken the fast, my urine is still very dark and does show cloudiness and adequate filtration. So I do want to make that clear. It's not like I've heard from other people that their urine all of a sudden becomes clear and normal right after breaking the fast. Of course, those who detox know that there is um, nothing normal about clear urine. Another thing that I want to mention is that my hands and lower extremities are really swollen right now as a result of breaking the fast. Somewhere around day 9 or 10, I had developed um, significant bruising on my lower legs without incurring any actual injuries. Now, I've talked about this a lot in webinars and other videos. Um, I do have a serious genetic weakness in my legs with severely impaired circulation. And now, wherever I have any weaknesses or acidic accumulations in my body, the water that I'm drinking is being rushed to those areas and is being held in order to help dilute these acids that are now causing me swelling, redness, and pain. And yes, that feels pretty much like hell. It's not pleasant. Now, what I am pleased about is the black mucus that still keeps coming out. And, um, you know, it has taken me years to get to the point of being able to finally drain my head with a consistent dry fasting, juicing, 
and the raw fruit diet. I can't, I can't help but laugh, and not in an offensive way, but just at, at their naivete when people think that if they go raw for three months and drink some juice, they'll all be fixed up and can return to their previous lifestyle and diet. <clears throat> you know, and I laugh because I used to be one of those people. And yet here I am nearly four years later and I still can't believe the amount of time and work it took to get here. But boy am I happy now that I finally am here. By the way, once you break your dry fast, you have an opportunity to continue to detox and get quite a bit um, more work done by staying on water for a few days. In essence, you are moving from dry fasting to water fasting, right? So the body's still cleaning itself. And so it pays to not transition too quickly and abruptly to juice if you can handle it. <clears throat> I would also like to touch upon something since I had a lot of time to ponder things over the last 12 days and this has to do with sleep or lack thereof during the fasting cycle, especially one that lasts longer than seven days. You know, as I was losing my mind going without sleep, I had a bit of an epiphany. Now, this is only my intuition, my gut feeling. This isn't science, so take it as you will. Uh, about 16 years ago, I went to a naturopath for the first time for adrenal fatigue and severe allergies. Of course, as any doctor, he gave no importance to the diet and put me on a bunch of supplements, amino acids mainly. Now this was the first time when I experienced severe insomnia and the doctor told me that the new amino acids were stimulating my adrenals and causing them to overproduce adrenaline which kept misfiring into my brain keeping me up. And as I remember this there was that voice in my head again that said you're making too much adrenaline which of course makes sense because when the body is under such extreme stress our fight or flight instinct gets activated increasing the production of norepinephrine which of course is going to make it very difficult to sleep because when we're in fight or flight, we have to be alert, we have to be ready to act, we have to be ready to uh, defend ourselves at the drop of a hat. So we have the biological machinery that helps us accomplish that. Now, additionally, when the body is hungry, our adrenals pump out cortisol to signal to the liver that we need sugar for energy. But since we're fasting and no food is forthcoming, this cortisol just continues to build. And if you know anything about cortisol, it's a stress hormone, which also keeps us up. So we now have created a chemical loop designed to keep us up as a survival mechanism. So then I got to reading on how to burn up excess adrenaline and turns out that it's complete long deep breaths and physical exercise. So I tried it 
and at the very least, it relieved my sleep-related anxiety. And I even got 30 minutes of sleep. Now, you may think it's laughable, but when you stay up for days, falling into unconsciousness for half an hour can only be described as pure bliss. It's not as easy to get rid of excess cortisol as it is of adrenaline, though. And so that will continue to remain a hurdle. But you can get some relief with breathing exercises, with cold air and ice, as well as physical exertion. Now, what I started doing was uh, to apply ice packs directly to my adrenal glands for like an hour or two hours at a time until everything went numb in the back. And I have to tell you, it did help quite a bit. So, something you may want to try yourself. Now, if you're going to be exercising at this point in the game, then I recommend that you focus on slow and measured movements rather than brisk ones. So as I neared the end of my fast, it was kind of rewarding to sort of uh, get at least some kind of plausible explanation to this fasting phenomenon that wasn't steeped in mysticism but just plain good old biology. Now the reason I say this is because there's a Russian woman on YouTube named Anastasia Zilevich who is a proponent of the movement called autonomy. This movement is defined by abstinence from food, water, and sleep. Now, I talked about energy before and how I look beyond what the person says and I sense their energy that's underneath their words because it gives me a more complete picture of their intent. Now, the way I perceive her energy, it's not of the highest caliber, shall we say. Of course, keep in mind that this is a highly subjective and personal experience that you should not take as gospel because I, like everybody else, have my own biases. The problem that I have is that she encourages her followers not to sleep, which, in my opinion, is reckless. Once again, it's important to understand what's relevant and appropriate for each individual. There are levels of human development and each of these levels comes with their own rules of engagement. Yes, it is true that once our consciousness expands and our bodies become less dense, we will no longer require food and sleep. However, forcing the body to go without sleep before it's ready is actually very dangerous. It can literally cause a person to go insane. Why? Well, first you need to understand why we sleep. Yes, there is a certain level of autophagy that occurs during sleep uh, that helps to clean up and repair the various bodily functions. <clears throat> but that is not actually the main reason we need sleep. 
the main reason is that when we sleep, we leave our bodies and travel to non-physical dimensions of our origin meaning we are reuniting with our soul, allowing us to absorb source energy into our astral body. And then this energy, of course, is transferred to the physical counterpart. Now, if we don't sleep, we don't get this vital energy transfer. And only those individuals that have the ability, conscious ability, to split their consciousness while in a waking state and be present in both the physical and non-physical dimensions simultaneously while maintaining full lucidity can, in fact, live without sleep. Even breatharian Victor Trubiano sleeps. He requires a lot less than an average person about four hours a day, and he doesn't get it all at once. You know, he says he sleeps two hours here, then another hour here, and then maybe another hour later on. But he still sleeps. So whenever you have a so-called guru telling you that sleep is detrimental and even harmful to the body, I would exercise a healthy dose of skepticism. So that's just an aside that I wanted to add here. Now I hope that following me on this fasting journey has given you some information that you could use and apply to your own fasting practice. The goal of this video was to show the reality of extended dry fasting and what it does to the body. You know, it took some hesitation and consideration on my part because, let's face it, who wants to let the world see them looking at their worst? Especially a person like myself who likes to be in control. I mean, just look at the mess that I am right now. So I do hope that doing this video diary did have some educational value. I hope it helped you, and thanks for staying with me. Hey, so I'm back with a little update. Um, so it's been three days since I broke my fast and um, I wanted to show you just how quickly the body plumps up uh, in a very short period of time only on water. So the, you can see from the pictures that the weight comes back fairly quickly and um, this becomes even more accelerated once you start introducing a little bit of juice into your diet. So far the recovery has been excruciating to say the least. I've been in a great deal of pain especially in my joints, uh, you know, my hands, my forearms and feet feel arthritic and swollen and hot to the touch. It's as if I have a hundred needles dipped in acid puncturing my extremities all at once. And this awful sensation of hot nerve pain is punctuated with intermittent numbness and at times this pain is so unbearable that all I can do is ice myself sometimes I just sit and just want to cry now this type of fasting withdrawal has been the pattern for me in the last three fasts and and this doesn't happen 
when I'm fasting uh, less than five days. Now I have heard of other people mentioning similar symptoms including um, the opera singer Artemanov who has been practicing dry fasting for decades and usually these symptoms begin to subside within several days once I start adding more nutrition like coconut water or juice because by engaging digestion you know we're slowing down detox and so the pain starts to back off a little bit so in my view it's the continued detox that is coming with water fasting that's causing these very very uncomfortable sensations because you don't get these types of healing crises when you are dry fasting and that's one of the biggest reasons I prefer dry fasting to water fasting you see what I believe is happening is that the water is dissolving uric acid crystals around the joints which makes you feel like your body is on fire and this pain remains until uric acid is flushed out and cleared away now what's interesting is that I have never experienced any of these symptoms outside of breaking a long dry fast from what I've read these are the ailments that um, that are already inherent but haven't manifested yet so when the body cleans really deep it gets to that level of weakness and brings up problems that could maybe manifest 10 years down the line and during the fast the body takes the opportunity to deal with these impending issues before they begin to manifest as a chronic condition so it's almost like a preview in a way of what's coming if we don't get our act together and clean house um, by the way I have um, an update on my nails you may remember I said that they were getting better and um, being repaired during the fast which is true but once once I broke the fast my nails started splitting and peeling off again so it hasn't been fun getting out of this fast my whole body feels extremely weak overall and I have little strength to even just do normal tasks I can barely walk sometimes now I plan on adding some coconut water to my diet later today and I hope that this awful pain starts to subside a bit 